I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Hey, I guess I had more time than I thought. Uh, so, today. I'm going to continue on. I probably should have made my uh, my uh, part two a three part instead of a just a two part um, because this really is... Think of this one as... I'm, I'm calling it part three to avoid confusion. Um, but it's really ties right into... Because this, this deals directly with what I was ending my last video with, which is about Wallace and the denial of... Um, sexual selection in in whole um and also specifically denial of um of intersexual selection as darwin defined it um now i wanted to make it clear because i think i i didn't want to give the wrong impression um again wallace was a brilliant man okay he wasn't it it's really easy to look back on those who were incorrect in the past and think what idiots they were um but you really have to look at what they said in context of the time, what was known at the time, what was observed at the time, what evidence we had. Remember, Darwin and Wallace both operated before the modern theory of genetics was out there, okay? Um, before, be, well, before actually almost any concept of genetics um, outside of simple inheritance, you know, all breeders had figured out. Um, right, This is right when Mendel's laws were sp being spread basically being rediscovered and um, we didn't have um, any any concept of like mo population genetics of the 1920s and 30s changed a whole lot and, and anyway so the point is they didn't have access to that likewise discovering of the DNA molecule and how and how it actually functions on a molecular level um, they didn't have those tools so it's hard to be t it's really hard to point fingers at right or wrong um, they were they were both make, looking at observations and making the best possible guesses. Um, okay, but anyway, but I want to I want to make it really clear when I say that um, Wallace was opposed to female choice. Okay, he, opposed to he didn't believe that females choosing the male with the best tail influenced the length of a peacock's tail, in that sense, in a real strict sense of the word. Um, but I want to make it clear, it's not that Wallace just denied, you know, he didn't turn a blind eye to colorful male displays and females picking mates, okay? He didn't believe that, he believed that females picked mates. He certainly believed that pe the peacock tail served a function in that, okay? I'm, he wasn't, okay, I'm not, I, I hope I didn't sound like I was trying to imply that he didn't. Um, in fact, for a long time, it was called um, Wallacean choice, Um females choosing characters. And I'm only going to look at females choosing mate. Um, th there's lots of examples of what works the other way as well and there's other more complex and sophisticated things. But I'm, I'm strictly going with uh, Darwin uh, Dar Darwin era understandings um, and then as it applies to more modern findings. So what Wallace believed um, and this, is di this, this, this discussion, a more sophisticated version of it going on today, is this conflict in intersexual selection between good choice or good genes. Okay, see, this is good choice, good genes. Um, good taste, good genes. Um, people say uh, truth in advertising is one way of putting it And in some ways. There's a whole bunch of different concepts associated with this, but basically what it boils down to as Wallace defined it, why Wallace, Wallace saw the female peacock peahen choosing the male on his tail size and coloration as just another form of pure natural selection because he believed that that tail existed only because the male peacock had good genes okay I'm trying to make sense out of that she wasn't she was looking seeing the tail and choosing the mate based on that tail but the tail existed because the male had good genes. So ultimately, her, her choice wasn't some aesthetic choice. It wasn't what a, what, a, what a pretty tail. Her choice was based on hardwired genetic code that the tail means good genes. Okay, so I hope that kind of gets clear. I'm, and I, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize when I'm using these terms. I hope you, you'll understand I'm meaning in a, in a, in a longer selective sense. Um, so it's this idea that, that the good genes are there. And so um, it's kind of a, if a male happens to be born with good genes, then he will 
because of natural selection, also have a nice big long tail. Natural selection, knowing that those two are infin infinitely tied to his mating success, tied those two together, okay? And uh, so that that was what Wallace was getting at. So he she he's saying that those those things that's why the choice doesn't vary. Okay, that's why females don't pick a short tail the next year because a short tail literally means genetic inferiority, bad offspring, low survival rate, low disease resistance, or something. It means something in the real world of genetics, or not that he understood, but in, in inheritance, survivability. Um. Well, Darwin argued that there was that was probably true. Okay? But he also believed that there was a an aspect of it that was not based on good genes, that was based on a choice mechanism, based on a something attracting the attention of the female. Um whether she found it beautiful or whatever it is, the point is that, that it didn't always mean good genes. It could mean good genes or it may not mean good genes. Um, it could be false advertising for good genes, okay? If that makes sense. So people have, since that point in time, have spun off multiple little sub-theories based on these concepts. All kinds of wonderful things. In, you know, everything from the Zahavi Handicap Principle, which states that the tail of a peacock is one example of it, handicaps the male. That means that he can't fly very well. So that a weaker male just simply wouldn't survive having a big tail. So therefore, if he's alive and has a big tail, he has good genes. That's called the Zahavi Handicap Principle. Um, other, you know, there's other, other things, other aspects of that too, the different, different evidences for it. While the good taste hypothesis goes to the fact that we find that if you do other things, if you take out the survivorship element, the longer the tail, the more preferred the male becomes. Um, meaning that if you take a peacock's tail, this isn't done with a peacock, it's done with another kind of bird, and you triple the length of its tail to the point of where he can't even walk, females love them. They flock literally flock to them can't get enough of them so that this this is like okay there's something actually attracting about the lo length of the tail it's not a just a proxy for good genes there's something else in that um, things like bird song bird calls which don't contain any genetic there's no way a, a bird with bad genes can make the same song as a bird with good genes so what what what's the attract what is the um you know what? What? What does it in that case? Anyway, it, and it's it's just a it's a great area of study, and I'm going to revisit these concepts later on down the road, especially when we get into humans and stuff like that, because it's completely relevant to people. All right, we have a whole lot of these same arguments are going on about good genes versus good taste. Um, do aesthetics? Do um, if a female human picks a male based on a characteristics that she finds attractive, does that attractiveness is that just simply the flavor of the month? This what 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 some magazine says is hot. I'm not trying to degrade. I'm not saying it in negative or trying to, um, or you know, or classic beauty or something that's just almost a frivolous idea of beauty, or does it mean something? Do males with that phenotype have stronger offspring? These kinds of so anyway that that's one of the things that we will get at and I will um hopefully get into some great examples of it and thank you.